triggered the greatest treasure hunt in history and a chain reaction of death. One by one, those who disturbed the pharaoh's tomb perished. Even today, the casualties continue. But now science is tracking an elusive killer, 3,000 years old. In a Pennsylvania hospital, a young woman is starving to death. The food she needs is oxygen. A simple cough has turned to lung failure. Doctors are stumped by the cause. Unknowingly, the patient's husband holds the first clue to her baffling disease. Its origins lie nine and a half thousand kilometers away in a land riddled with age-old mysteries. This is a valley of death. Chiseled out of the rock is the world's greatest mausoleum. 1,500 years before Christ, the pharaohs of Egypt were laid to rest here in the Valley of the Kings. It is said that you can't take it with you, but they did. Each pharaoh was buried with a king's ransom. Ivory, ebony, gold. Each tomb camouflaged by the barren desert. But when archaeologists arrived centuries later, they found only withered bones. Others had been here already. Tomb robbers. For archaeologists, the Valley of the Kings still offers the richest pickings on Earth. Yet once they believed it hid no more surprises. Certainly not a lavish tomb for a minor pharaoh. His childhood, like his life, was cut short. At nine, he took the throne and a wife. Nine years later, he was dead. Little else is known. Leaving just the skeleton of a life, he suffered a fate worse than death. He was forgotten. 3,000 years later, only a handful of men even knew the name, Tutankhamun. One was an equally obscure archaeologist named Howard Carter. The other, his backer, George Edward Stanhope Molyneux Herbert, 5th Earl of Carnarvon. He was very much the Indiana Jones, if you like, of his day. Um, he was into all sorts of exciting adventures. And indeed, he drove one of the first racing cars. And he took part in a rally, and he had a terrible accident. And he was thrown out of the car. And owing to his injuries and subsequent ill health, his doctors told him he could no longer winter in the cold, wet climate of England. But in those days, um, even if you had a common cold and you had enough money, your doctor would immediately dispatch you to Egypt to recuperate uh, in the dry heat. That resulted in ultimately coming together with Carter. And so began the great quest to find the tomb of King Tut. A low-born commoner and a wealthy lord were unlikely partners in what experts deemed a shot in the dark. Carter had no modern tools like metal detectors or sonar equipment. But unlike his predecessors, he methodically dug up the Valley of the Kings, yard by yard. But all he found was sand, acres of disappointment. Just before Christmas in uh, 1921, Carnarvon sent for Carter here at Highclere Castle to tell him uh, that he could no longer afford 
to go on funding what appeared to be a useless project. Carter explained there was very little left to do and begged for one more season, which Carnarvon agreed, but made it absolutely clear that that was the final season. On the third day, workers uncovered stone steps leading to a hidden doorway, stamped with an ancient seal. It was the mark of royalty. After five years of bad news, Carter sent his partner a ray of hope. Carnarvon was having tea with his daughter Evelyn here in the hall at Highclere Castle when they got a telegram saying, think of discovered entrance to magnificent tomb uh, with seals still intact, awaiting your arrival. But while Carnarvon was on his way, something unnerving happened to Carter. Carter lived on his own, and to keep himself company, he'd bought a canary. And the boys had all been very excited by this yellow bird. And they said, this wonderful yellow bird will lead us to the tomb. And as he went back to send the telegram, having just found the tomb, his houseboy ran out carrying a bundle of yellow feathers. And he said, Master, I heard a rustling. And when I went, the cobra was eating the canary. This is an omen. This is unlucky. Master, don't open the tomb. Go, go near it. And the workers naturally leapt to the cobra, which is on the headdress of every pharaoh. And the pharaoh had come and eaten the symbol of hope and it was going to be a miserable time and everybody was going to have, you know, terrible things would happen and so on. And Carter said, don't be such a damn fool, just make sure the cobra is no longer in the house. By dusk on November the 26th, 1922, workers had excavated a second doorway bearing the seal of Tutankhamun. It also bore the hallmark of thieves, a patch where the tomb had been broken into. It seemed Howard Carter was 3,000 years too late. Alone in the passage stood Lord Carnarvon, his daughter, Lady Evelyn Herbert, Carter's assistant, and Carter himself. Before him lay the find of his life, or a tomb for his dreams. An eternity passed while Carter peered into the gloom on the other side. At last, Carnarvon whispered, can you see anything? Carter replied, yes, wonderful things. Carnarvon and Lady Evelyn and Pecky Callender, they're, they're behind him, you know, going, what is, what is it, you know, for Pete's sake? And finally he says, you know, wonderful things, uh, full of emotion, he could hardly speak. And he looks in and he sees this chamber just cluttered with treasures. The entire room glittered, and all that glittered was gold. Carter was stunned. We'd never dreamed of anything like this. A whole museum full of objects, some the like of which we had never seen. The whole thing was overwhelming. There's never been a pharaoh found in any way almost intact. People have been searching for them, dozens and dozens of great pharaohs, the richest people, the most powerful people of all of history, in perfect condition. We're talking about things that you look at now, you cannot believe that these are the thousands of years old that they are. It's awesome. I can't think of another dig that's as good as this. Can't think of it.
Carter later said that they looked around, then left. But evidence says they did more that night than just look. Carter and Canaveran were not allowed by their franchise to enter the tomb without an Egyptian Organization of Antiquities official present. And they never said they entered it. They waited. They looked in. They saw wonderful things. You know, they went bananas. And they sealed up the hole. And they waited three days for the guy to get down from Cairo to go with them. Would you have done that after 10 years of extraordinary struggle? Would I have done that? No, I would not have done that. And they did what you and I would have done. They went in. And they spent all night in there. The smallest in the group, Lady Evelyn, led the way inside. Three men, one woman, and somewhere, a dead boy. They were like the thieves of ancient times. The place was a shambles because the thieves, and there were two sets of thieves, had gone in there, and there is some indication that at least one of the two bands of thieves was caught. The chances are, if they were caught in the act, ah, head off, and that's it. The party began to count their blessings. They would eventually total 5,000. The tomb of Tutankhamun was the greatest find in history. Overnight, Carnarvon, Carter, and the Pharaoh would become celebrities. 